Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to Foundations and Practice in Data Visualization. This is the second webinar in the European Foundation Center webinar series. This webinar series has been brought to you by Microsoft Unlimited Potential Grants, and we want to say a really big thank you out to them. And just a little bit about who we are. I am Kyla Hunt. I'm going to be your facilitator today, and I am the Webinar Program Manager at TechSoup Global. And with us today is Cole Nussbaumer. Cole, could you unmute yourself and introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Are you able to hear me, Kyla? Yes. Great. Um, so a little bit of background on myself. Uh, my name is Cole Nussbaumer. My background is in applied mathematics and business. And I've worked across a number of fields, uh, but one constant in my career is that I've always been in an analytical role. And for the past, past four years, that's been at Google as a manager on an analytics team there. And nearly every day, I find myself in a situation where I need to convince someone to do something using data. So over time, I've developed a series of best practices for doing so. And one day I thought, I should share this. So I developed a class a couple of years ago that I teach at Google that's focused on effective data visualization. But then I thought, why stop there? Being able to communicate effectively with data is a skill that many can benefit from. So I've developed material to share more broadly and have partnered with a number of organizations like the Grant Managers Network in the States and today the European Foundation Center uh, and TechSoup to help people understand how to tell a story with data. And so that's what we're going to focus on in our session today. Thank you so much, Cole. And just a little bit about today. Um, again, the most, the, um, for the most part, it's really just going to be Cole sharing the information that she has with us today. And I'm going to give control over to her in just a moment. If you have any questions about her content throughout the presentation, go ahead, type that into the questions pane. And I will be reading those questions at the end of the presentation to Cole so she can answer them verbally. We'll try to leave at least 10 minutes for questions. If for some reason we don't get to any of your questions, I will go ahead and share Cole's email address at the end of the presentation. Okay, with that, Cole, I'm going to go ahead and give you control. All right. Okay. And are you able to see my screen now? Yes, it looks great. Perfect. All right, then we'll jump right in. So in school, we spend a lot of time learning about language, how to read, how to write, how to tell stories, and a lot of time on math, how to make sense of numbers. But it's rare that we learn how to combine these two things. So it's rare that anybody actually teaches us how to tell stories with data. And yet that's becoming something that's very important in business uh, and in the philanthropic world today. And what ends up happening since we don't learn this in school is that we rely on our tools to help us understand best practices. And our tools, unfortunately, or a lot of our tools, let us pretty easily do things that actually get in the way of the information that we're trying to share and make our message, um, kind of hide our message versus um, make it stand out more. And so what you see on your screen now is an example of a not very effective graph. There's a lot of um, what we might call chart junk happening, things that are there that don't need to be there that are actually distracting from our data. And we'll come back to this example uh, later in the hour and talk about how we can use the lessons that we'll be learning to take, take this from Excel defaults, which is what we see here, to a visual that tells a story. And that's going to be the focus of what we talk about today. So my goal is to give you the basics to produce effective quantitative displays of information. And we're going to do that through three key lessons. So we'll start off by talking about different types of graphs and some use cases for each. In the second section, we'll try to get comfortable with identifying things in our graphics that don't need to be there and feel comfortable eliminating them to make our data stand out more. 
And then in the third section, we'll talk about how people see how you can use that to your advantage as you're crafting visuals, um, and really how to focus your audience's attention where you want them to be paying their attention. And then we'll apply the lessons that we've learned. We'll take a look back at the graph I just showed you, and we'll walk through um, the, the, the three lessons here and talk about how we can use those in a real-world example to take a visual from kind of an okay graph to a full story. So with that, I want to jump into our first section, which is choosing the right type of display. And so a lot of times when we have data that we want to show, a graph or a table are the first things that we think about. But before we get there, I want to spend a moment just on simple text. So the numbers that we see on this page jump out at us, right? $300 billion, 250 billion euros, $600 billion. What I want to highlight here is that when you have a single number or a couple of numbers that you want to highlight, often doing so through simple text, as we see down here, is going to be more powerful than putting them in a table or in a graph. When you're dealing with just a few numbers, putting them in a table or a graph, they, just, they lose some of their oomph. So don't be afraid to show the actual numbers. When you do have more data that you want to show, though, typically a table or a graph will be the way to do this visually. And one thing to understand is that audiences interact very differently with these two types of visuals. Tables, we read. So tables, we talk about, they interact with our verbal system. When I think about when I have a table in front of me, I typically have my two index fingers out. I'm reading across rows. I'm reading down columns, I'm comparing values, and tables are great when you have an audience that's going to want to do just that. So if you have a diverse audience who's, where everyone is going to want to look at their specific piece and, and, and the data within that, tables can be very useful. Or if you're in a situation where you have a lot of different units of measure, that can sometimes be difficult to pull off in a graph, so a table can be good in that case as well. Graphs, on the other hand, interact with our visual system. It's a high bandwidth uh, information flow through our eyes into our brain. Um, and, and they're amazingly powerful at showing large quantities of data in an easy to consume fashion when they're designed well. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, but graphs are great when you have something to convey with the shape of the data or to show relationships between different variables. So I want to stop here and do a quick thought exercise. So what we have here is a pie chart. Um, let's say that these are sales revenues in Europe. And I want you to look at this chart and think about what observations you can make based on the data that you see here. So when I look at this chart, the sorts of observations I can make are Spain is the biggest, Iceland is the smallest, uh, Germany and Holland look like they're maybe about the same size, but I can't tell for sure that that's the case. And so I can tell a few things generally with a pie chart, but I can't tell very much specifically. And that's because the human eye doesn't do a good job of attributing quantitative value to two-dimensional spaces. Um, that said in a simpler way is pie charts are really hard for people to read, so we want to be careful about when we use them. Another way to envision the same data is what we have on the right here. So it's a horizontal bar chart. We've ordered the segments from greatest to least, and with a horizontal bar chart, what our eye is actually doing is comparing the endpoints. So now I can see not only that Spain is the biggest, but also how incrementally larger it is than Germany. I can see conclusively that Germany and Holland are exactly the same size, and so on and so forth. But we lose something in this transition from pie to bar chart as well. With a pie chart, one thing that we get is this idea of there being a whole, and thus parts of a whole, which you just don't get with a bar chart. 
Um, so when that's what you're wanting to show, so the, the breakdown of a whole, and especially if you want to highlight just one segment or just a couple of segments, a pie chart may be a good visual to use in that case. You just want to be aware of some of the challenges that exist when people try to read pie charts. And so if the specifics are important, you need to actually label the numbers on the pie chart um, and do some things with pre-attentive attributes, which we'll talk about a little bit later, to make sure that information is easy to consume. But the main message here is that you want to um, use, be careful when you use a pie chart. And if you can articulate why a pie chart is the right chart type, then that shows that you've put enough thought into it to make that decision. If not, you may want to try thinking about other chart types that might meet your needs. So let's talk now about some different types of graphs. Scatter plots are great for encoding information simultaneously on an X and a Y axis. Line charts. Typically, the X axis on a line chart is going to be some unit of time, days, months, quarters, years. And the reason for that is because we actually have the points physically connected in a line chart, you actually only want to plot continuous data with a line chart. Because if we were to have categorical data on our x-axis, we're imposing this connection that may or may not make sense. When you have categorical data that you want to show, a bar chart is the way to do that. Um, bar charts, I think, sometimes are avoided because they're common. In my opinion, that's the wrong approach. We should use bar charts because they are common. It means that our audience already knows how to read them. And bar charts, by the way, are very easy for people to read. They're easy for our eyes to, um, as we talked about, determine this value kind of between the endpoints of the different segments. Um, so what that means is when you use a bar chart, your audience has less of a learning curve to get at the data that you're providing. There are different types of bar charts. This is what we're looking at here is kind of a standard vertical bar chart. There's also the horizontal bar chart, like we looked at a moment ago. A good use case for horizontal bar charts is if your category names are really long. Because, the, because of the way it's oriented, it means that you can orient your labels from left to right as most people uh, in Western cultures read. Um, so it helps make your chart a little bit more legible for your audience. There's also the stacked bar chart. Uh, a good use case for the stacked bar chart is if you want to be able to compare the totals across different categories, and then within a given category, you want to be able to see the subcomponent pieces. They're less useful, though, if you want to be able to compare the subcomponent pieces across categories, because once we get past this first series, we no longer have a consistent baseline by which to compare. Um, so you just want to be careful about when you use those. Pie charts, area charts in general, as we talked about, people, our eyes just have a hard time attributing quantitative data to that two-dimensional space. So in a situation where you use them, you want to make sure that you provide labels and um, other things to make it easy for your audience to interpret. Uh, and while we're on 2D, I want to spend one moment on three dimensions. Um, my personal opinion is that 3D should never be used in charts. Uh, 3D adds in a lot of complexity that um, doesn't bring any value with it. And we'll look specifically at an example in a moment. Um, and I like to say that there are very few rules when it comes to data visualization, but one of those rules is don't use 3D. Uh, this is just a sampling of different chart types. There are a lot of different types of graphs out there. Um, here's another sampling of uh, different graph types. And the point here is more that you need to first ask yourself, what do you want to show? Um, is it a distribution, a comparison, relationship between two variables, the composition of something? And the answer to that question will lead you to the right kind of suite of charts that may be appropriate. And within that suite of charts, the right answer to the question, what chart type should I use, is always the same. It's always going to be whatever is going to be the easiest for your audience to interpret. And one good way to get a feel for that is put a chart together and show it to a colleague or show it to somebody who has never seen the information before and give them kind of minimal background and ask them to tell you what they see. And if they're focusing on what you want them to focus on, then you've hit your mark. If they aren't, however, you may want to revisit the design. And one of 
the pieces of design to think about is the type of chart that you're showing. So what I'd like to do now is walk through an example of choosing the right graph uh, given the data and the question that we're trying to answer. So the question that we're trying to answer in this case is how many active duty personnel are in each military branch? Um, so the data we're looking at here is um, military branches of the US. And we visualize it like this. So the first thing I want to do here uh, or is a couple of things, actually. Uh, I want to smash the pieces together and kind of turn it on its side. Um, for me, this visual is really hard to look at um, because there's just a lot of stuff that's taking away from the actual data that's being shown. Um, so let's start by at least doing that. So now we've flattened our pie chart, um, and we can take a look at the actual data that's there. So let's look back to our question, though. Does this answer our question? How many active duty personnel are in each military branch? It doesn't, right? Because what we're looking at here is the, the percentage, so we can see the breakdown, but not the number, which is what's really being asked for. So in this case, a bar chart is probably going to be the best way to visualize the information. Um, but not this bar chart. Right, because here we've introduced 3D again, and you can see what happens with the introduction of 3D. We get this weird side panel, uh, shadowing, uh, stuff that doesn't add informative value. It's basically taking up space without adding a commensurate amount of value. And another really bad thing um, that I recently learned is that Excel, when it's graphing 3D, it actually doesn't graph from the front of the bar or from the back of the bar. What gets graphed is the midpoint, which means there's really no good way to be able to look at the bar and trace it to the um, axis and, and understand what that value is. Um, so stay away from 3D. Um, one way that I would suggest uh, looking at this data is something like what we have at the bottom here. Um, so notice it's simple, it's clean, and what that means is it's easy to read because there isn't stuff there that's detracting from our data. Our data is what speaks the loudest. Um, I think over time, and you know, especially with the introduc introduction of computers and, and everybody being able to create graphs, there was a drive towards sexy of being able to kind of add on as many bells and whistles to our data graphics as possible just to show that we could. And I think that's when 3D um, and you know, flashing lights and, and some of the other things came in. And now we see the pendulum starting to swing in the other direction. And one of my goals is to kind of help push it along. Um, and to show that simple actually gets our message across in a much more powerful way than uh, the 3D and, and all the other sort of what Tufty calls chart junk. So that, that is uh, the end of our first lesson. Next, I want to talk about eliminating clutter. Um, clutter gets in the way of our visuals. It detracts from our data. Um, so we'll start by talking about the Gestalt principles of visual perception. The Gestalt School of Psychology set out in 1912 to understand how individuals perceive order in what they see. Um, what they came away with were the Gestalt principles of visual perception, which are still understood as how people interact with visual stimuli today. And we'll talk about them here because of some of the um, learnings that we can apply to tables and to graphs. So the first principle is proximity. We tend to think of things that are physically close to one another as belonging to part of a group. So we can use this in tables. So in this example, simply by virtue of differentiating the spacing between the dots here, your eye is drawn either across the row in the first case or down the column in the second case. Next principle is similarity. We tend to think of objects that are like color, like shape, like orientation as belonging to part of a group. So again, we can leverage this in tables to help draw our reader's eye, um, getting rid of the necessity of strong borders to do so. The next principle is enclosure. We tend to think of objects that are enclosed together as belonging to part of a group. And note that it doesn't take a very strong enclosure to do this. Oftentimes, simple shading, uh, light shading, is enough to do the trick. 
one way we can rely on the enclosure principle is to highlight or help draw our audience's attention to a certain point or a certain part of our visual. The next principle is closure. This one's interesting. Interesting to me. It says that most people, when faced uh, with the first two visual stimuli, for example, uh, will see a square with a piece missing as opposed to two opposing visuals. The closure principle says that we like things to be kind of ordinary and fit in the constructs that are already in our head. Um, and similarly, on the right side, people will see a circle with a piece missing. And so this causes us to question some of the things that are done standard in um, some of our graphing applications. Dark borders, heavy backgrounds. These things actually take away from our data and aren't adding the value that we think they are, right? On the right-hand side, we still see that graph as part of a whole unit um, without the need of some of these other things that detract from or distract from our data. The next principle is continuity. This one is similar to closure. It says if we take the objects in the first panel and pull them apart, most people would expect to see what's shown in the second panel, whereas it could just as easily be what's shown in the third panel. So again, one thing that the Gestalt principles of visual perception let us do is question some of the things that are there and play around with stripping them out. So here, for example, I don't show the y-axis, and yet we see that those bars are all lined up at the same point. And arguably, in this case, our data stands out a little bit more than it otherwise would. The final principle is connection. People tend to think of objects that are physically connected to one another as belonging to part of a group. And the associative property of connection is stronger than like colors, like shape. Um, it's typically not stronger, though, than enclosure. But this is one that you can play with um, by strengthening or weakening the enclosure and the connection. And one place that we use the connective, value, or connective um, principle quite frequently is in line graphs to make sense of the dots that we plot. And so what I'd like to do now to make the Gestalt principles uh, a, a little more real, uh, a little more practical and accessible, is to walk you through a specific example of stripping out the clutter. So the graph we're looking at here is the impact of fluctuating gas prices on customer behavior. So we've got three trend lines being shown. The top one is shopping for sales more often. So these are um, practices that people in, say that they engage in based on a survey because of it, fluctuating gas prices. The next series is using coupons more. And the final series is spending less on clothing. And so we can see how those things change over time. There's a lot of clutter happening in this graph. And what I'd like to do is point out the clutter, and then we'll look at a version where that clutter is taken away. Um, and when I say clutter, what I mean are things that are there that are taking our focus, taking some part of our visual attention, but aren't adding any informative value. So for example, this grayish purple shading, that we can strip away. The grid lines. Um, my personal view on grid lines is that if you've got a case where you're physically going to be wanting to trace your finger across the page, across the grid line, and look for specific values, then you want to leave the grid lines in. But usually that isn't the case. And if that's not going to be the case, we can strip those grid lines out. It actually makes our data stand out a lot more. And at the very minimum, if we leave the grid lines in, we want to make them a lighter color um, so that they fade into the background and don't detract from our data. Uh, we've got a trailing zero on our percentages here that isn't adding any informative value, but again is taking up visual space, so we can trim those down. We may have too many kind of labels across our y-axis, or excuse me, our x-axis here. And then another thing that's really challenging for me about this graph is that the legend is down here at the bottom, and these series are kind of strange um, encodings. And so for me, I actually have to look back and forth a number of times to feel like I confidently know which series is which. Um, so that's something that we can play around with and improve. And then also, every data point being labeled with a marker on here it just adds a lot of visual clutter that may not be adding so much informative value. 
So what I'd like to do now is take a look at this visual redone with some of these things stripped out. Here's what that looks like. So what we've done in this case, we actually took the y-axis off altogether and instead labeled the beginning point and the end points. And what this does also is it focuses our audience's attention there. So the way we've labeled this makes it clear that the comparison we want them to make is between the beginning and end points. Now, if that weren't the comparison we wanted them to make, we would take a different approach at this. But that was my assumption for this visual. We've labeled the series directly versus having a legend at the bottom. So here we're leveraging the Gestalt principle of proximity. Um, so simply by virtue of having them close to one another and by having them the same color here, it's clear that the text here describes the trend here. Um, so you can see how as we strip some of these things away, grid lines, background shading, the point markers, our data stands out a lot more. So let's look at where we started. And then now applying our lessons and stripping out the clutter, we end up here. So our third lesson is on focusing our attention. So what I want to talk about here is how people see and how we can use that to our advantage when we're crafting visuals. So this is a picture of how we see. On the left-hand side, you have light refracting off a stimulus. And this gets captured by our eye. We don't actually see with our eyes. Rather, our eyes act like little cameras, take pictures of the visual stimuli, and pass those pictures onto our brain via electrical currents. And it's in our brain where what we actually think of as visual perception takes place. In the brain, there are a few types of memory that are important to understand for being designers of um, data visualizations. And the one we're going to spend some time on is iconic memory. Iconic memory is short-term memory, short of and short-term memory. It's um, beneath the level of consciousness. And the powerful part of it is that it's tuned to a specific set of what we call pre-attentive attributes. And pre-attentive attributes are hugely important tools in our data designer tool belt. Um, so what I want to do now is actually take you through an exercise with pre-attentive attributes. So an exercise in pre-attentive processing. So this is the processing that takes place in our iconic memory, kind of before we even know what's happening. So what I'm going to do is, on the screen, I'm going to put up a series of numbers. And what I'd like you to do as fast as humanly possible is count the number of fives that you see. All right, as fast as humanly possible, I want you to count the fives, and then we'll talk about it. Ready, set, go. So there are six fives on this page. Um, but this was a bit difficult, right? Not technically difficult, but it took some time. You had to physically scan these four lines of text, look for five, which is kind of a complicated shape. Now, watch what happens with the slightest change. Wow, right? The fives just jump off the page at you. You almost don't even need to think about it. You, you don't even have time to blink. And suddenly, there are six of them there. I want to show that again for emphasis because it's important, right? They were hard to pick out when we were looking at this screen, and then suddenly they're so easy to see. And what we're doing here is setting the fives apart from everything else simply with a pre-attentive attribute. Here we're varying the hue or the color of the fives to make them the one thing that's different from everything else. And this is a hugely important thing, because what this says is that pre-attentive attributes, if used strategically, can help us get our audience to see what we want them to see before they even know they're seeing it, which is like crazy powerful stuff. So let's talk for a moment about the different pre-attentive attributes. And I won't read through all of these, but you can see as your eye scans across the page how it's just drawn to the one that's different from the rest. You don't really even have to look for it. We can categorize pre-attentive attributes, and note that I'm doing so here through the pre-attentive attribute of color, into four categories. 
in blue, we have pre-attentive attributes of form. In green, pre-attentive attributes of color. There are attributes having to do with spatial position, motion. One thing to understand about pre-attentive attributes is that people tend to associate quantitative values with some, but not others. For example, most people will consider a long line to represent a greater value than a short line. But we don't think of colors in the same way. If I ask you which is greater, red or green, it's not really a meaningful question. And this is important because it tells us which pre-attentive attributes can be used to encode quantitative information and which should be used as categorical differentiators. In pre-attentive attributes, we really, in, in data visualization, we can use them primarily in two ways. So the first is to draw our audience's attention to where we want it. And, oops. Um, and, and the second is to create a visual sort of hierarchy of information. So to let our audience, give our audience some sort of signal to understand what is of first order priority that they pay attention to, what's second order priority, and, and so on and so forth. And we can do that through placement, through color, um, through making some things stand out stronger on the page than others. Uh, one example of pre-attentive attributes in action, any periodic table. This is a massive amount of information, and yet it's conveyed to us in a way that's relatively straightforward to interact with. So we have things offset spatially um, by color. The names of the periodic elements are big and bold. They, let us to, they allow us to be able to find what we're looking for in the table. And then there's more information there as we need it. But it's not all crying out for equal attention, um, which would make it overwhelming if that were the case. And so, as I talked about, we can use pre-attentive attributes to draw our audience's attention to where we want them to focus it. Um, you can think of pre-attentive attributes as a way to let your audience into your head as you're designing visuals and make it clear to them where they should pay attention. And we can use these both in the charts themselves, um, you know, through color, through the thickness of lines, uh, and also through the words that we use to describe. So what I'd like to do now is walk through an example of using pre-attentive attributes strategically. Um, so this is the chart we start with, uh, distribution by life stage segment. I did a talk similar to this at a US retailer last year and um, had participants submit example visualizations ahead of the course, and this is one of the submissions. Um, so what we have here is the US population by segment. So these are customer segments. So these might be things like teenager or young family or um, elderly. And so we can see what the US population looks like in terms of those segments, as well as the customers of this given retailer. And so let's look at this from a pre-attentive attribute standpoint. So our eyes, if we look away and look back, they aren't really drawn anywhere. They're kind of drawn everywhere because we have um, equally strong colors happening um, and, and no real clue as to where we should pay attention except for this red box here that you actually have to look at the visual because everything's so strong. You have to look at the vis visual for a while to, to even see that highlighting. So one thing we can do is be more strategic here with our use of pre attentive attributes and use them really to draw attention to where we want it versus um, using color throughout. So here's what one possible remake of this same visual could look like. And again, we're using the exact same visual here, simply playing with some of the pre-attentive attributes. Um, so here we've made everything a shade of gray except the segments where we want to focus our audience's attention. And so if you look away from the screen and look back at it, for me, my eyes are drawn to this middle segment here, these segments three, four, and five, um, which is a clear sign that that's where the designer of the graphic wants me to pay attention. And with the summary 
statistics here, we get an easy comparison. Okay, these segments make up 29% of the U.S. population, whereas our customers, 42%, lie in these the segment three, four, and five. So basically, as we see at the top, we're over-indexed there. And depending on what that is and what we're going through in our strategy, that could be a good or a bad thing. And, and we can take more text to explain some of that. But this is meant to show just how being smart about how we use pre-attentive attributes like color um, and thickness of lines can help draw our audience's attention to where we want it. Um, before we wrap up this section, I just want to do a brief uh, couple minutes on text. So I think one thing that happens when people are thinking about data visualization is um, sometimes there's an assumption that text has no place. Um, you know, it should all be visual. We shouldn't have to read anything. Uh, but that's not the case. <laughs> uh, text is great for helping us convey to our audience what they need to know, where they should pay attention, what they're looking at. And there's some text that always needs to be there. So any graph needs a graph title. Every axis needs a label. Um, the only exception is, you know, if, if our x-axis here were January, February, March, then you probably don't need to label the axis months of the year. But pretty much anything that's less obvious than that needs an axis title. And that's because even if it's clear from context, the absence of an axis title allows a little bit of space in your audience's mind to question. You know, oh, I think I'm looking at X, um, but I'm not really sure. And by having the title there explicitly, you just you don't take up any mind share on that question, which allows the mind share instead to be used on interpreting the information that you're providing. Uh, call out boxes are great for highlighting uh, or drawing to attention to a specific point. So here we're using the Gestalt principle of, proximity, or of, of connection excuse me, to make it clear that our text relates to this point. Um, findings, recommendations. If, if there are specific findings or conclusions or recommendations to make based on your graph, state them explicitly. Don't ever assume that somebody else looking at the same data is going to make the same conclusion. If there is a specific conclusion you want your audience to draw, state it explicitly. So now what I would like to do is go back to the example that we looked through or that we looked at briefly at the beginning of the hour and take you through step by step applying the lessons that we've learned. So here's where we start. So what we've got graphed here are melanoma, so skin cancer incidences per 100,000 people. So we have three trends. Our green bars represent Australia. Our blue bars represent the United States. And the red bars represent the United Kingdom. Um, we have data from 1975 through 2007, 2008. Um, and note, our Australian data doesn't come in until a little bit later. So we start having Australian data around the early 80s. Um, and this is what we're looking at. So these are, our y-axis here is the um, number of melanoma um, instances per 100,000 people. And so um, what I want to do here, so this is what happens if I graph just the raw data in Excel. So I'm on a Mac, so it may look slightly different from if you graph it in yours, depending on what um, type of computer you're using. But this is what it looks like when we let Excel visualize the data. And so I typically like to start by stripping out some of the things that don't need to be there. So the first thing I want to do is remove this chart border and the grid lines. And here's what it looks like when I do that. So already our data is starting to stand out a little bit more. Now I want to clean up the axis. Um, so our y-axis here, as we looked at in one of our other examples, has a trailing zero that isn't adding any informative value, so I want to get rid of that. Um, we maybe arguably have too many dates happening down here. Um, it causes them to be at this weird angle, which just draws our eyes in a weird direction. Um, probably don't need all of these tick marks um, that are there between the data points. Um, and our axis labels are kind of loud at this point. They're, they're black and they're big. Um, they need to be there, obviously, for reference, but they don't need to be drawing so much attention. So let's de-emphasize those a bit. So we've de-emphasized them. I actually took off the tick marks um, in this case and uh, labeled just our beginning point and end point. And again, based on what you want your audience to focus on, that, that could change how you address this. Um, one quick note, 
um, one assumption I want to make here uh, that I didn't talk about at the beginning is the story that we want to tell. So let's assume that the main point we want to make with our visual here is how high um, the melanoma instances are in Australia. Okay, so now that we've stripped out some of the clutter, we can start looking at our actual data and specifically talk about what sort of chart type we want to use. Um, notice we've got time on our x-axis. Time is a continual variable. We're looking at a trend over time. So a line chart is probably going to be a better way to visualize this than a bar chart. And here's what that looks like. And so we do see that easier um, to visualize, except now Excel's added back in some chart junk here with the um, markers on every point. So let's strip those back out. Um, we've got a similar thing to what we looked at with one of our other examples where our legend falls pretty far from our data series. So let's label those directly. Again, we're leveraging the Gestalt principle of proximity here and just making it easier to read, right? Making it seem like less work for our audience to interact with the data that we're providing. Um, one thing that I typically like to do, so um, in Western cultures, most people read left to right, top to bottom. So I tend to left, kind of top left, justify everything. Um, what that means is then that your audience will encounter the axis labels, titles, um, before they get to the actual data that they're trying to interpret. So if we do that here, so I've moved our title now to the left uppermost. I labeled our y-axis, so cases per 100,000 people, added a source down at the bottom. So we're starting to look pretty good here. Um, let's see, what else do we want to do? So I think visually, we could stop here with the graph. Um, it's looking pretty clean, it's straightforward to read. So this is a good point to stop and think about the story that we want to tell. So when I look at this graph now, so like I said, I kind of start top left. Um, so what I encounter first is the Australia line, um, then US and UK. Um, so this actually, the, the way just I encounter these almost makes for more of a story of the UK being quite a bit lower versus Australia being higher. So I think we could maybe have a more powerful story if we build up to the Australia point. So I want to take a look, and this is just playing now, of what happens if we split our trends into three graphs. And so here's where we end up with um, if we do that. <coughs> Excuse me. So now the story I get to, because again, I start to left, go to right, UK, OK, USA is a little bit higher. And now it's, wow, look at how high Australia is. So I, I'm liking this layout from the point of the story that I want to tell. In this new version, though, now we've split out the trends onto different graphs. So our differences in color is no longer necessary. So we can get rid of the differences in color. I've made them all blue here. Um, and I can draw a additional emphasis to how just how high Australia is by actually cutting off the y-axis lower on the UK and US bars. And note one thing that's important is I do need to keep the 25s lined up across the graphs um, so that uh, everybody is able to make an apples to apples comparison here. And so now this is looking good from the standpoint of the story I want to tell. Um, but again, as we talked about before, I don't want to show the data and assume that somebody else is going to come to the conclusion I want them to. I want to state it explicitly. So I'm going to add some text to do that. So my text, instance of melanoma cases in Australia is more than double that in UK and USA. It's increasing along a super trajectory or you know, whatever the story is that you want to tell here. And now I've got my data to show that story. So I want to just back up and look at where we started and where we end up, ended up after applying some of the lessons that we learned. Um, so ended up in a place that uh, I think tells the story a lot better and it enables that story to come across to our audience in an easier to digest way than it did with our defaults. So that is the main content that I have to take you through today. I want to do a quick wrap up of what we've learned and then we'll see if we have any questions from the group. So we've gone through a lot. I went through it pretty quickly, so um, hopefully some of it will stick. But we started off the hour of talking about different types of graphs, some use cases for each. When highlighting a number two, think about simple text. We use line charts to show continuous data, bar charts for categorical, talked about using pie charts judiciously, um, and really letting the relationship that you want to show and the question you want to answer guide the type of chart that you choose. 
in the second section, we talked about chart junk, identifying it, understanding, getting comfortable with eliminating it to make our data stand out more. So we learned about the Gestalt principles and leveraging them to cut out some of the unessential things, um, breaking complex messages into multiple pieces, using contrast strategically. And in this final section, we talked about how people see and how we can focus attention where we want it using pre-attentive attributes. So these are things like color, size, placement on the page, and we talked about how we can use those both to direct our audience's attention and also provide a visual hierarchy of information. So we've got a couple minutes for questions. Before we get there, I just want to point you to a couple of resources. Um, I write a blog that's at storytellingwithdata.com. There you'll see a lot of blog posts. Um, there is uh, additional information listed out, recommended reading. Um, so definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and I also post on Twitter, and you can follow me at storywithdata. And that's the content that I have to take you through today. Great. Thank you so much, Cole. That was some really, really great information. Um, so everybody, if anybody has questions, please type them into the questions pane. And, and Elliot, my, my colleague at TechSoup, who is also on the line, will be gathering those questions. Um, I don't see that any have come in yet. So let me go ahead, Cole, I'm going to go ahead and take um, control away from you so I can get my questions slide up. And as I do that, everybody, if you have questions, please type them into the questions pane. Well, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Cole, um, just let me let me say it was really interesting to me how you were really emphasizing on telling a story with the data and choosing what story to tell with the same data. Um, do you ever come across anybody who is worried that that is going to, or do, is it ever difficult to choose to tell a particular story and still maintain the integrity of the data? If that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, that does make sense. I, I get that question quite a bit. Of you know, and it, it comes down to I think where you see um, your role in kind of the value add chain, right? Because um, I think a lot of times we think about just showing data and letting users or our audience come to their own conclusion, um, and I think people in general err on that side maybe too much, um, where we should be taking it a step further and not only presenting the data in a way that people can interact with it and make their own conclusions from it, but also stepping into that analysis piece of, well, you know, what is the data actually telling us? Because a lot of times when we have data that we're working with, we are subject matter experts in that field or, or with the sort of um, information that we're trying to envision. Um, so the onus should be on us then, given that we know more um, as the designers um, of the visuals to help our audience make that next step from not only here's the data, but here's what it means, here's why it's interesting, here's what action we should drive based on what we're learning from it. Um, so I would argue it, it generally is the analysts or the, the person who's presenting data um, should be presenting it with some sort of, so what? I mean, why should we pay attention? What's interesting about it? Or what do we need to know? What do we need to take action on? Right, right. And I think it's that, that last part of what to take action on that's really the key part of this. Mm -hmm. And that I can, I, I, you know, that, that this would be such a powerful tool to uh, complete your organization's mission or complete your foundation's mission with data that you already have. Um, I, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in, so I do want to give a couple of more minutes in case anybody does have those. Again, type those into the questions pane if you have them. Oh, never mind. I do see some. 
Yeah, and actually, I see one on here that says, yeah, I um, do apart see from storytelling with data, are there any other free websites or tools that you recommend? Um, so, yeah, one thing, one resource that I'll point you to, um, if you go to storytelling with data, there are a list of blogs that I follow. There's a lot of good information out there um, and kind of uh, ongoing discussions on best practices in this field that you can find um, from bloggers. There's also a list, um, If again, if you go to my site, there's a tab called Additional Resources. And there's a list within that of books and articles um, and a section on tools, um, a lot of which are free. Um, so I'd recommend taking a look there. Great. Thank you so much. And we also have a question. Are there any favor favorite websites or projects that have told data stories really well that they might explore? Um, so one thing that I typically point to people to, so one place that is known for having effective data visualizations is the New York Times. Um, so going to the New York Times website, um, reading some of the articles and, and looking at the data visualizations that accompany them there can be one source um, to go to for that. Just thinking if there's anything else that jumps to the top of my mind. Um, that'd be probably one of my recommendations. Okay, um, for great. books, if anyone's if anyone's interested in um, reading more about this or just getting a little bit more um, theory and application a little bit deeper into a lot of the things that I discussed, definitely um, my number one book recommendation would be Stephen Few's um, Show Me the Numbers. Um, he goes very in-depth into pre-attentive attributes um, and, and a lot of the things that we covered here, but kind of the next level and, and also with a lot of uh, practical examples. Okay, great. And if you think of any other um, suggestions, just go ahead and send them to me and I can send them out in the follow-up email that I sent to everybody. Great. Great. Um, we also have a question, is Excel the main user-friendly program to translate data into graphics? Um, so user friendly, I would say not so much, um, okay. but it is the main tool that I think is used um, by um, probably the largest number of organizations. Um, everything that we have gone through today, every, all of the examples that I've looked at are done in Excel. Uh, I sometimes refer to it as brute force Excel because it's not always so straightforward um, from getting, as we saw in the example we walked through, from the default settings to a visualization that you're happy with. Um, and actually, the sorry, I feel like I keep plugging my blog here, but the latest post I have up is a step-by-step -step on how to go from the defaults in Excel to a final visual, which is actually walking through how you would do that. Um, so I'd say you can do a lot with Excel. It does take time and patience. Um, if you're looking for an application that um, where the defaults are, are more set up kind of along the lines of some of the things we've talked about, Tableau uh, is one I'm familiar with that um, follows a lot of the sort of principles that we've talked about today. Um, I haven't worked with it a whole lot directly, um, but I've heard good things about it. Okay, great. And do you use Illustrator ever in using any of these? Ryan not Creator in any graphs? of the things that I showed today. Okay. So everything today was in Excel. Cool. And we also have a question, just out of curiosity, how did you get into this field? Oh, um, yeah, that's, let me think if I can tell uh, a short version. <laughs> um, I honestly, so my, my background education-wise is math and business, and I've, I've always just kind of found myself in this space where I'm translating between those two ends of the spectrum. So bringing in the quantitative piece, but making it resonate um, with the business side of things. Um, and have always just been kind of fascinated in how people learn and take in information visually. So um, uh, in my latest at Google um, got the opportunity to actually do a little bit of research behind why people, uh, you know, why some graphs end up being more effective than others, why people's attention is drawn to certain places, um, and, and through that research then developed the course there. Um, and yeah, just kind of threw myself into it and have fun with it, so um, like to be able to share what I've learned. Okay, great. We also had somebody who was wondering if you ever do presentations regarding the use of different fonts and if there's any way that they could attend a similar presentation. 
That's interesting. I um, have not <laughs> done a presentation um, specifically on fonts, and it's interesting if um, I, I do a lot of reading in the design field as well, because a lot of um, design principles, is, as you can understand, um, come into play in visual uh, in visualizing data as well. And it's interesting. There are entire books. Um, focused on nothing but fonts. <laughs> um, but my quick response uh, to that question would be, the simpler, the better. Um, like in a lot of the things that we've talked about, um, and especially if you're, if you're projecting something onto a screen, um, you want to stick with a um, sans serif font. So one of the ones that doesn't have kind of all of the little squigglies on it, um, because those are visually complicated and, and just makes it, it's a little bit harder for people to read. Um, so I'd say my general advice would be stick to clean, easy to read fonts. Um, and if you're ever wondering if your font is clean and easy to read, show it to a couple people and ask. Or look at things in two different ways, side by side. Um, you know, one with one font you're considering and something with, um, so my standard is Arial. Um, you know, one with a simple font like Arial. And just oftentimes you can tell by looking at things side by side which is going to be easier. The same is true for when you're trying to pick a type of graph, right? Graph your data a few different ways and look at it side by side and see which um, visualization is going to be uh, kind of, where, where does your information pop? And then that's what you want to use. Okay, great. Thank you. And I do want to just take another couple of moments just to see if there are any more questions that are coming in. Uh, so if you do still have a question, please go ahead and type that into the questions pane. I do want to mention, since Excel has been mentioned quite a bit, um, that TechSoup does offer a donation program uh, with Microsoft where that, that is open for both NGOs and foundations, and in often case for European foundations. Um, to find out if you're eligible for that, you can go to TechSoup.org, and I will be going ahead and sending out the link directly to the Microsoft Donation Program page, so everybody can take a look at that, and that will be going out in the follow-up email as well. And I'm not seeing any questions, additional questions that are coming in. If I do get any additional questions, Melissa, let me just double check. Nope. I'm not seeing any additional questions, so if I do get any email to me, Cole, I will go ahead and forward those to you. And again, thank you so much for this presentation today. It has been really fabulous information. Um, I'm curious if there's one, you know, big takeaway that you want all the audience members to, to take with them, what would that be? Um, so one thing that we didn't cover specifically, but that was kind of implicit in our section on pre-attentive attributes, is that color should always be an explicit choice, um, because it, it, it is the strongest pre-attentive attribute um, for drawing your audience's attention. So um, be thoughtful and explicit uh, when you're choosing color and how you're using it in your graphics. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Cole. And again, thank you for being willing and able to present. And Elliot, thank you so much for getting up and helping out with the chat. That's been really helpful. Again, everybody, if you have any more questions, go ahead and write this email address down for Cole. I will also be sending it out in the follow-up email. So if you have any additional questions that you did not get answered today, you can go ahead and follow up directly with her. And again, I do want to go ahead and thank the Microsoft Unlimited Potential Grant again for allowing the European Foundation Center to and helping them to create this webinar series. We do have one more webinar in this webinar series coming up on December 7th. You can go ahead and register for that at the link that's at the top of the screen. And I will be sending that out in the follow-up email as well. The December 7th webinar is Using Technology to Educate, Empower, and Engage. And our speakers will be Saida Sakali and Anya Adler. So I really look forward to seeing you all at that. And again, a little bit about me. We're at, I'm at TechSoup, and we are a nonprofit organization that does try to provide technology and technology resources to nonprofits around the world. And this is just a little bit about, again, who we are, where 
part of TechSoup Global, which is working towards the day when every nonprofit, library, and social benefit organization on the planet has the technology, knowledge, and resources they need to operate at their full potential. And one more thank you. Thank you to our webinar sponsor, Citrix Online, for providing the GoToWebinar tool that we use today. So again, I really thank you all for being here with us. If you have any additional questions, you can go ahead and email me at khunt at techsoupglobal.org. And if you, go, if you need to go ahead and get out of this webinar, you can go up to File, Exit, Leave Webinar, and please take just a moment to answer our survey. It's really, really short, three or four questions, and it will help us in creating better webinars in the future. So again, thank you all for, for attending today, and thank you, Cole, and thank you, Elliot. Thanks, Kyla. Thanks.